All right, good morning. Um, as you just said, I'm Dan Megenhardt. I'm a software engineer at INCAR. And um, I can't take full credit for this system. It's been developed. The, all the software that goes into it has been developed over many years at INCAR. Um, and specifically for this product, I, I'd like to recognize Nancy Rayhawk and Gary Blackburn, who were instrumental in getting this together. Um, I took over from them, so uh, I learned a lot during that process. And, and so, yeah, my, my focus is just going to be on the uh, tech transfer of this system. And so my objectives are pretty much going to follow the documentation that comes with the tech transfer. I'm just, you know, it's just going to be an overview, the soft, the uh, documentation is in a lot more detail. So my objectives are just to give a basic understanding of the hardware requirements, or at least what our recommendations are. Uh, what are the input data requirements? What output data you can expect from the system? And I want to go into a little detail. I try, try not to go into too much detail about the, the processing steps that are happening in this system. And I just want to finish up with showing a little bit about the robustness of this system since it has been developed over many years and been used for many years. The um, hardware I'm showing here as an example was what we used during the demonstration. It, we had our, our regular system, but we needed a backup just in case we had a hardware failure. So we, we used an older system that was kind of retired from another use. And I really considered this the, the bare bones system that could actually run this Romeo type system, it's, which is a three satellite system. So it has two four core processors in it. So eight processing cores. There was 24 gigabytes of memory, which is really pushing it. I, would recommend more like 48 uh, for this system. And then we had one terabyte of data. So that stores approximately seven days because we produce 150 gigabytes a day in this system. And of course, depending on the needs, you know, as uh, for a research like us, we'd like to have days, um, especially during a demonstration in case we hear later of something that occurred, we want to have the opportunity to look back and see what uh, what might have been going on in, a, in the real time system. And it, it's required to be on in the Linux OS. And we did test the builds on four different flavors of Linux, uh, two Debian and one CentOS and one Red Hat. So by testing, we showed that the builds work fine and the software ran. As for data requirements, first of all, there's the model data. We use the GFS uh, 0.25 degree global forecast grids. There's three fields that go into it, the, the isobaric surface heights, um, that's a 3D field and geopotential meters. We also use a tropopause height, uh, which is a 2D field. And then we have the isobaric surface temperatures, which is another 3D field. And that data updates Every six hours, we have a new run, typically a two hour latency in that data. So we use multiple forecast lead times to cover specifically if a model run doesn't show up so that we don't lose the model data. For the satellite, for the imager data, we have the two channels that Ken talked about, the 6.2 micron and the 11.2 micron channels. For Romeo, we use goes east, goes west. And just I just put a note in there that uh, goes west is uh, being replaced in early 2023. And that was more because of the uh, cooling system issues with the original goes 17. And then Himawari, and these are all full disk scans that are updated every 10 minutes. For the lightning data, we had the geostationary lightning mappers off the two GOES systems. 
That covers up to 52 degrees north, about a 70 to 90% flash detection efficiency and 20 second product latency. And to uh, go it, as another uh, lightning source, we have the ground-based lightning data, which covers the higher latitudes and, you know, uh, Himawari doesn't have a, GL, uh, a GLM, so it, it's needed if you want to cover the Himawari uh, domain. As for the outputs, we have two different versions. We have the gridded outputs, as you can see in the uh, images here to the, to the right. And those are output in a GRIB2 format. And then we have of an XML format, which is the polygons, which is what have been shown that's uh, used in the cockpit for the displays and has the lower bandwidth requirements. I, I don't wanna, like I said, go into too much detail on the, the processing of, of the whole system, but I'd like to just give it a little bit of an overview of what's going on and how many processes are running and this depiction is uh, showing groups of processing. So we've got GFS ingest happening. We have lightning ingest happening. We also have the ingest of the different satellites along with um, the processing to produce the CTH and CDO. Then that all has to be merged. And then we produce the polygons and uh, formatting the GRIB2 products for delivery. Uh, I stayed up here, there's over 100 processes that go into this system. Um, and each of those processes are running real time constantly. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in this system when, uh, near the end of the talk. But uh, obviously each of these groupings has different processes running under them. Some are identical as far as the process, but with different instances. Here's an example of the processing for just the GOES E satellite. There's 15 processes running in this step. Uh, GOES West is pretty much identical, except we had to do some work to make up for the uh, cooling system problems and the data problems that resulted from that at times of, certain times of the year. Uh, Himawari is, again, all these satellites should basically be the same. We had to do something with Himawari just because the NGES software didn't handle calculating a satellite zenith angle. So we had to run a separate process for that. But um, I think everybody can see my mouse, hopefully. Uh, up here we're, is just the process. We have to get this data into our internal format for the other applications to run. And so we got the ingest of the two um, satellite bands, the ABI data. We combine that into one data field so that it can be used, both, both channels could be used by different applications. So we did, here we are calculating the overshooting top. There's an algorithm that does that. We have two different instances of the uh, cloud top height running with uh, model data being the input as well as the ABI data. And these were, were what we're trying to do is take advantage of two different approaches and, and merge those to get the best result, taking advantage of the strengths and weaknesses of each. And in this step, we're, we're try we need the cloud top height to do parallax correction of the two ABI fields. And, and then from there, once we do that, then we calculate, uh, we do some interpolating of the missing data that you get when you do satellite parallax correction. So it just takes any small missing data points and interpolates surrounding data to fill that in. And then we, we calculate the cloud top heights again using the two approaches. And then what comes out of that is the final cloud top height. And then the second, the extra step is this global convective diagnosis that Ken talked about. So this channel differencing goes into, um, along with the uh, cloud top heights, go into a, a fuzzy logic engine that produces uh, 
a preliminary CDO field. I'll show more about what uh, the final steps are for the CDO in the next slide. But basically out of this comes the CTH and there's just some basic uh, data processing steps to finish that off. Here's the CDO. Uh, one of the things I wanna talk about is there's a smart approach to how you wanna combine satellites. So any time you have an overlap in the satellite, you have to figure out how to take, how to merge that together. And so what we use is a satellite zenith. So these, if anywhere where two points, two satellites are um, co-located points, we, we find the one that has the closest satellite zenith angle and use that because that's the, the better data. So the further you go out in angle, the the more the data is degraded. So we're taking the best possible data points when we merge these together. And then this fuzzy engine is also used again. Once these data are merged, we take this merged uh, CDO, I mean GCD CTH field. We bring in the uh, the overshooting tops and the satellite. I'm mean, sorry, the the, the uh, lightning grids and run it again through another fuzzy engine, which then produces the final CDO. And that, we do a little bit of smoothing and thresholding to clean it up, to get it ready for applying the uh, polygons. And then again, some uh, interpolating if you have some missing data points in the data. For the CTH, we basically have the final product. We again, just do some interpolating and thresholding for one, we for the grids, we only put out 15,000 feet and above. And there's some steps again on the cloud top height to make it uh, do better with the merging, or I mean, the producing of the polygons. Now, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was the robustness of these systems. So I did talk about how this has been around a long time. Uh, the underlying infrastructure has been used here at NCAR for over 25 years. It's a, it's a Linux-based system, and the Linux OS is a, a very tried and true OS. Uh, the one piece we use in this Linux system is a cron, which is a time-based job scheduler, which has been around for a long time as well. And that keeps that's used to keep this auto restart running, and I'll talk about that when I talk about the key components. The, um, in these systems, um, almost always the, the uh, points of failure uh, when you lose uh, the products is either the hardware or the input data is not arriving. And that's, that just kind of attributes just how solid these systems are and, and the software that goes into them. Some of the key components that keeps these systems running and makes them robust is what we call, we have a proc map application and which is a C++ based application. And every process that runs in these systems uh, communicates with that proc map, putting out information about uh, that it's up and running, that it's, uh, it'll even put a status of where it's running. So, uh, we're at in the code, depending on how much was added into the code um, during the development of that piece. So ProcMap retains information about the name of the application, an instance that goes along with it. So we have an instance name, so we can track if we're running the same application at different points in the system, we can track different instances of that what host it's running on, the user that's running it, the process ID associated with it. And again, it has a heartbeat that's sent to ProcMap or that ProcMap reads and an uptime and how many times it's registered and a, again, a status message. And then there's this auto restart that I talked about earlier. And that's the one piece that we got to make sure is always running. And we, since it's the one that's in charge of keeping everything else running, there has to be something else to keep it running to make sure it's going. So um, we run that uh, cron to keep that running. And so it uses this information coming from ProcMap 
to know uh, is uh, all the process is the process is all up. If if not, you know, is it hung? Which means, okay, we have a process ID, but we don't have a heartbeat recently from it. So that then knows that it is frozen and we need to restart it. Or if there is no heartbeat and there's no process ID, we know that this software, that application is crashed and we need to go in and, and restart it. So that's how we keep things running. Even, you know, there's always a possibility of glitches in data that comes through. So those glitches can sometimes cause a piece of software to crash. So we, this is how we keep things up and running. Um, we also have a janitor that's in charge of data scrubbing so they can keep the disk from filling up. You can it's uh, configurable to how many days you want to keep data, how full you want the disk to be able to get before it starts scrubbing, things like that. And the last piece I wanted to talk about is what we call a data mapper. And that retains information about the data. So every time an application writes, it sends out information that the data mapper collects. And that's very useful for, um, there's some scripts that come along with this um, system that you can configure how long you want to, uh, a data set, how late you want a data set to be. And it can send out an email, uh, warning that the data has not been produced. So that data mapper information is used by those scripts. And we also have some real-time viewing diagrams that use that as well. So that's all I had. I tried to keep it short and simple. Hopefully that covered enough information. And are there any questions? Thanks, Dan, great presentation. So could you walk us through the technology that we're going to transfer with, with the Romeo system from your processes? What, what, what processes is in this transfer package? Uh, there's a lot of processes in it. Yeah. Uh, if you could go back to your slide, you had that slide uh, where you walked us through the the processes right there. Yeah. This one or the next one? The next one, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I, I somewhat covered it, but the uh, there's an application that's used to ingest the two different channels of satellite data into, uh, it's, it's called MDB. It's a meteor, meteorological data format that was developed at NCAR. And that's what's used internally within the system. So, so we have to get that data into that format and usable for the application. So that's what that application is. And, and these, all this software comes with the system and there's build scripts to build all these. Um, so uh, there's a, I get this MDB combine is just a simple little script that says, okay, I've got a, I got the 6.2 micron data here, the 11.2 here. Let's bring it together into one file because some of the applications need both of those fields and, and don't have the ability to go read them from two different locations. Um, so that's, it's just a way to simplify using the data by combining it. Overshooting top is another application that comes with it. It's its, its own application that produces the overshooting tops data that goes into a CDO. And then cloud top height. Now all these are C++ applications. Um, overall, there's C++, there's some Perl, Python, and shell scripts that go into making this whole system. Uh, uh, just to finish off these, uh, again, here's a, a merging. It's, a, it's software designed to take two different fields and merge them together in some smart way. So, so that's included in the system. Then there's a SAP parallax application that does the parallax correction for the two uh, ABI fields. And all these that say MDV is just, it's just applications that were built on the MDV uh, infrastructure and needs that input. So uh, 
this step, I, I don't think I actually talked about it, but it's thresholding out um, the data based on the satellite Zenith. So we don't want to go maybe any more than 70 degrees out from Nader on all the satellites because of the aggregation of the data. So we do a, a thresholding there and that's what this application does. It takes in the, the satellite Zenith and the, uh, the uh, parallax corrected data and gets rid of any data outside of a certain Zenith angle. And then the, uh, the interpolating is just software written to do an interpolation of data points. So if you have one or two pixels missing in the satellite, we can take the surrounding data points and interpolate those to fill in that one little gap. And again, we already talked about the cloud height. And so a lot of these, like I said, are, are repetitive in that there's the same uh, application. And that's what you're seeing below these is the instance name associated with each of those processes. So to keep those unique, we need to have an instance name because you have, you can see here in just processing the goes, we have four different instances of the cloud cup height running. And um, set drive is what we use to derive the, the GCD, which does the channel differencing. And, and then there's this fuzzy engine, which is a fuzzy logic engine that brings in different data sets and applies weights and functions to produce the output field. So um, does that answer? The question for the most part, I mean, like I said, there was over a hundred processes running and some of them are duplicate applications. I didn't count how many different applications are provided in here, but there's probably at least uh, 20 different applications that come with it. Yeah. The reason for my question was to show the community the amount of technology has been transferred through this program to the user. Uh -huh. yes and want to show how comprehensive it is. So Yeah, and like I said, this has uh, been developed over many years in different stages. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of code and processes that run in this system. And that's why I said there's over 100 that are running at any given time. And I guess one thing I didn't mention is it's it, this is a data-driven system. So these applications are up. They're registering with the process mapper saying I'm up and I'm running and they're looking for the new data set to come in. Once that data comes in, then they process that data, hand it off to the next process. Dan, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what it takes to maintain the system? Because obviously it has been around for a long time. Operating systems change, newer versions come out. How much effort is typically required to kind of stay up to date with the latest versions of operating system or ProScript or whatever else is you know coming along? Yeah, obviously that's uh, depends on how much the uh, operating system changes, and that's sometimes they're very minor and there's nothing you need to do. Other times, you definitely have to rebuild. And when you rebuild, there may be some issues because of changes with the operating systems and their libraries and stuff. So um, in those instances that, you know, that can take very little time to a lot of time, depending. I haven't seen too many over my years, too many times that we've had to do a lot. But that the nice thing about here is we have other engineers using this data, these applications. So, you know, some people may already adapt to a different OS before I even have a chance to uh, to check it out. But um, yeah, there's, there's um, I, I don't know if I answered the question fully, but it, it, it depends, I guess, is the answer. And they, they're very stable systems. So maintaining them outside of OS, uh, changes is very minimal. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely answered it. I, I was more thinking within our environment, as you said, we have different engineers using similar things and, and you help each other out and that makes it easy. But if you 
hand over the technology to someone else and they are on their own yeah. in terms of maintaining. That was kind of what I tried to bring out and see how much effort it is. And obviously it depends on how much an operating system may right. change. Yeah. And they could always reach back out to us and, and have questions that we can assist them. Right, right. And we, we all know there's a lot of different operating systems. I only covered like Debian, CentOS, and Red Hat. Now, there may be other issues with other ones, but Linux is pretty much Linux. So it's rarely that much different. So. Hey, thanks for the summary. Um, Matt Eckstein, I'm a tech pilot at Delta. You talked about interpolating for pixels that you were missing. Is there logic in place so that there's a point at which you're missing too much information and you'll just accept the gap? Yeah. That's right, because you don't, you can't interpolate too big of areas because then you might be giving misinformation. But we don't usually see that, the parallax correction, you know, by limiting the Zenith thing we use, which limits the amount of parallax correcting, you don't usually see large gaps in the, the satellite data for that reason. Sometimes the gaps can show up in, um, depending on the configuration that you're running too. So part of this is configuring the applications and, and the, the Romeo configuration that we're delivering has, like you said, the four cloud top height algorithms, right? Two for the parallax correction and two for the, the actual cloud top height determination. Mm -hmm. So that helps eliminate some of the things too. We also have a storm size filter in there too, which can remove smaller, if you don't want, I think Romeo is probably tuned for larger storms, adjustments for smaller storms to allow those through too. So part of it's delivering the entire environment in order to make this run. And then part of it is adjustments that you might need right. uh, along the way. So yeah, yeah. anyway, it's multifaceted. I also wanted to say the environment that you're delivering this underneath is a giant infrastructure that is tried and tested over the years. We use it for other applications that have been tech transferred to other organizations outside of CTH and CDO. And depending on what they want to do, they can treat it as a black box. The main thing is compiling it, getting it to run on their test data, running their regression tests, and they're good to go. Um, but, you know, some things happen along the way. You know, they may need some support. Um, Raytheon being one example for the uh, NWP, the next gen weather processor. That kind of uses some of the fundamental underpinnings as well. So anyway. Yeah, and yeah, good points too, because if they don't get the same data sets coming in that you we used for the system, then the 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 ingest applications possibly won't work. So that that's another thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Uh, th two questions. Um, so far. The testing for GOES 18 has gone very well, and uh, we don't see the coolant problem that uh, that we saw on right. see on 17. Um, so assuming everything goes well and it's moved into place next year and, and starts operations, um, I would think that that would make some of your processing a little bit easier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, I didn't show goes um, goes this west processing. Kathy, you know, we, it was kind of last, last minute, we had to adjust to these data issues. And so she had, uh, had to figure out how best to deal with the data when it was going bad. And so she added in just a couple more processes to help with that. Obviously, we still had a lot of bad data come through, but it was trying to minimize that issue. So that will help to uh, not only simplify the processing a little bit, but make the data better all the time, hopefully. <laughs> uh, my my follow-on question to that then is right now you're, you're running it basically 10 minutes. Right. Um, I, I believe the plan then, assuming 18 is, is going good, um, it, is the output will be every five minutes again oh, okay. um, for both, seven, both uh, 16 and 18. And I believe Himawari can do five minutes as well, or maybe they already are. So I... I could the software then handle a five minute update? Well, the software can, it's just the hardware. 
it would have to be tested and to see if it can keep up with a five minute update. But realistically, it would be up to the vendor. I guess they could do five, 10, 15, whatever, whatever they wanted, I guess. Yeah. Uh, based on that then. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Any other questions? <laughs> Didn't expect this many questions. <laughs> And, and this may be a Ken question, but uh, if you did a five minute update, the CDO is still a 10 minute update because we you look at it at 10, 30, and 60, right? So, well, we'd have to do some reconfiguration with the lightning data and how we, we group it together. But, um, you know, the lightning, I think, update is every five minutes. At, and so that, that can be. Yeah, with the satellite signal. For goes east and west, you can get five minutes, but it's only conus. And the Himawari five minute is, uh, it's a floating view. So it's not always over the same area. So it's, it's really tough to use that because you wouldn't have continuous coverage. So, yeah, I mean, you could use a five minute conus and then um, do everything in five minutes in CDO as well. Yeah, that was going to be my question too. When you said there was five minute updates, I didn't think it would be full disk, but and we, we try to use a full disk. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the question is, is it worth the work to make a, a five minute update of just the CONUS when we're really trying to cover Oceanic anyway? So uh, if it is truly just CONUS, then it may not, it may not be something we'd want to do. All right, I probably used up my time. There's nothing else. <laughs> All right, thank you.